morning, everyone. Good morning. Give me a warm welcome to worship this morning, especially when we come on this. What was it we described it as? It's Father's Day. Thank you, Isabella. <laughs> did you make Daddy breakfast in bed? <laughs> did, did he make you breakfast in bed? <laughs> the, the Father's Family Fun Day, I think, is how we've sort of cast this all out. And so you're very welcome. Uh, and we pray that you'll be able to hang about as we move across to the hall uh, after our, our time of worship today. Uh, just a couple of reminders. The PW trip is not actually going to happen uh, this week. It, it's been postponed now until September. Uh, to make you aware of that, uh, we'll be praying later on uh, for the General Assembly that's taking part later on this week, Thursday. Uh, Friday and Saturday will be opportunities if you so wish uh, to sign in online and follow all the procedures. We'll talk a wee bit more uh, about that uh, later on. After the service, I'll remind you at the end, if you go across to the hall immediately after the service is, is finished and, and go into the big hall um, and there you'll be able to get a, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, uh, just to sort of wet your whistles. Um, we have our, our, our Michelin chefs uh, about to prepare, so they're going to slip out if they haven't already done so um, to prepare the, the food for us, and, and so we'll get that served out as quickly as possible, and we'll talk you through the rest of the day. Service is slightly different uh, this morning, and so we're going to start with a, a word of prayer. And then it'll be a block of praise. Um, one is, is new and it's it sort of hand in hand and we're practicing. Um, but let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness and your love. We thank you indeed that we have come this morning to praise you, to worship you and to give you our thanks. So be with us as we lift our hearts to you, lift our voices. Lord, that we will realise you are our strength, our mighty tower. And so we ask, be with us this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to keep our seats as we sing this first of three. And then we'll stand if you're able to sing uh, the next two. In some ways, they, they take that message of, of how our, our strength is in Christ. He is our focus. And so the first hymn we sing is, As morning dawns and evening Fades, you inspire songs of praise. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Keep our seats as we sing this together. Mm -hmm.
And so we stand now to sing the splendour of the King, how great thou art. And then we'll continue on in praise as we sing, My Jesus, my Saviour, nothing compares to you.
normally sing one song and we sit down, don't we? One song, sit down, one, you know, one. Sorry for confusing. Ben and Barry are going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. We pray today for dads, new dads, granddads, stepdads, adopted dads, and solo dads, baldy ones, beardy ones, skinny ones, and cuddly ones. Dads who tell bad jokes and dads who dance to YMCA. Dads who know how to fix things and dads who just pretend. Father to the fatherless, we pray for those who this day is sad and when it is happy. Those who feel they have failed. Those who are grieving children they never had. Those missing their dads or their children, even more than usual. Father God, in a world where some dads are distant, absent or even abusive, we lean into your ever-present love. You are faithful, especially to those of us orphaned, abandoned and hurt. Even if my father abandons me, the Lord will hold me close. Father of comfort, heal our wounds, restore, our, restore the dignity, integrity and centrality of fatherhood in our nation. I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives in its name, and I pray that you may know love. And finally, Lord, for all those poor souls everywhere who forgot that today is Father's Day, and we ask you to bless them in their abundant grace and manifold mercy with the discovery of chocolate and half decent cards in surprisingly well stocked convenience stores. Amen. Sort of planning for the week ahead. I 
probably at this stage, I'll probably just finish a bit of a catch up with my support staff where we'll be sort of looking ahead to the week in terms of seeing what customers have gone out to see, what meetings we have, um, what days are due to hopefully finish later on the week and complete for our customers. Okay. Does faith reflect your work? <coughs> uh, yes. Uh, the nature of my role is that I have a, a range of customers who I look after right across Northern Ireland. Um, and that's in a range of sectors, a range of scales, right up from owner-led businesses, and, and they put their trust in me to deliver for them their business. Um, and they'll come to me looking at finance or funding for their investment plans. And um, thankfully, more often than not, the answer is yes, we can support you, but sometimes you have to have diff difficult conversations if their plans are maybe a wee bit too ambitious at this stage. So, Faith very much acts as a, as a guide to help me make those right decisions. Okay. Is there anything that we as your church family can pray for you about? Um, probably like probably like every every family here this morning. Um, we lead really busy lives. Um, I think Christina and I are looking forward to the schools breaking up more than the girls. Um, from September onwards, life can be very hectic. You've got work demands, school, homeworks and then the girls with their various clubs and activities and Sophia or Christina sorry would uh, would probably include my rugby in that so <laughs> um, I suppose it's just prayer that you know we despite how long life gets that we remember uh, and prioritize what's really important to us um, and probably also that we don't take too much advantage and push our luck too much with Billy and Ari when it comes to the child care. As I said to you uh, earlier in the service, the General Assembly is on this week. Now, what do you know about the General Assembly? What do you think the General Assembly do look like? Do you think it's just all the ministers and elders, representative elders from across the board, meet in assembly buildings in Belfast, and we go there, and we drink tea, and we do lunch, and we have a jolly old time, and it's just all lots of fun? Is that what you think the General Assembly is all about? Yeah. <laughs> I need a rep. <laughs> you can come along with me this, this year and see how much fun it is. Over the years since I've been involved in PCI, it, it has begun to change and evolve. And, and this year is probably the shortest, I think, that the Assembly has, has ever been. It, it starts on Thursday. It's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But Thursday to Friday is we're starting at 10 o'clock in the morning. And Thursday night is, is a time of worship. So it will go on to half nine at night. Uh, Friday, the business is 10 to 9. And then Saturday, I think they're hoping that it will pack up at lunchtime. But I suspect that we might still be going into business during Saturday afternoon. And, and so it, it has evolved because in, in some ways when you go, um, what you tend to look out from the, the platform or whatever, there's a lot of grey-haired individuals sitting about. And so they've tried to change it and tweak it, and it's a bit later this year, uh, to try and think of the younger folk uh, who are at universities and, and so on, uh, coming sort of under 30 reps, that 
actually then what happens is they might be, act, be able to come and, and deliberate and discuss and, and, and so on as part of that. Maybe making it shorter for those that are working and sacrificing their time, it, it allows it to come. But what if the key bits of business we're going to discuss this week is this wonderful title, The Reconfiguration of Ministry, which is probably one of the biggest things that the church is going to wrestle with in the incoming year. Sometimes we look around and we think there are dwindling numbers, you look at the back of the Herald and you see how many vacancies there are, it's now getting to be a stage that they're having to go over leave. And so it's a full big double page, the back of the Herald and some. Um, we're seeing dwindling numbers perhaps in the congregation. It could be very easy to just look at it as doom and gloom. And so this reconfiguration of ministry is an opportunity for us to come and to think and to pray, um, to, to consider how we can begin to be more fruitful, uh, to think of new ways in which we can do church. But all of that's going to come as, as an impact across the board, across our denomination. And so I think within presbyteries, every presbytery is going to be affected. Every congregation in presbytery is ultimately going to be uh, affected over the years as we begin to work out and plan how that is going to look within our little catchment there. Is there, uh, there's been papers submitted and, and responses made and so on. Uh, but at even at one stage, although it's now been knocked down a road a bit, that we're going to uh, reimagine presbyteries, and so instead of having 19 presbyteries, reducing the numbers, but reducing the numbers of presbytery just means there's more congregations, and they're thinking we can do it better if there's more of us. But um, having come from a presbytery that extended from from Valley Kelly all the way down to Donegal Town, you can think of the geographical spread of that in Ireland. There are some of our presbyteries that take up practically all of the west coast of Southern Ireland, so it's huge, some of our geographical areas. And so we're really trying to get our head around this, and this is the beginning of a conversation, and part of what we're going to discuss is a, a two-year plan of how we begin to, to work this out in our congregation. So we may trickle off and, and do all this bits of business, and you can think, well, sure, they're all the way, that's brilliant, and Mark will enjoy the rest. And he'll feel so refreshed when he comes back next Sunday. When I'm in the pulpit, you'll just see my, my eyes will be bright. Um, my hair will be so excited and, and whatever after having uh, three days of all this COVID. <coughs> but this is something, as I said, is going to impact our congregations. But we see that God might be moved. And there's other bits coming out of some of the councils of helping us to remember that we are to be present. Present in the power of God, present in the, the reality of his presence with us. Because he is a strong and mighty power. He is a great and wondrous God. How great is our God. And so as we look to him to move in our midst, pray for us. Pray for us while we're there. Pray for all the speakers. Pray that we don't get caught up in, in other stuff that sometimes can distract us. But instead we may come with a prayerful heart and a heart seeking how the Spirit may pour out upon our church in these days. So we're, we're going to do that now. We're going to pray for the General Assembly, for our new moderator and his wife, um, as we begin to uh, understand perhaps what God is leading us into and through uh, in the days uh, to come. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that as Presbyterians, we understand we do things better together. We thank you indeed for the, the, the length and breadth of our church, the width of our church that, that impacts this whole thing. But Lord, we cry out that we might be an authentic witness to the gospel, authentic witness to your kingdom. And Lord, at times we know how difficult it can be, how difficult it is to serve the Lord. Father, we thank you that you're not finished with and that you're still seeking to build your church and to grow your church and to move through and in your church. So we pray for our general assembly. We pray for the new moderator who will uh, be elected later on this week. We pray for Richard that you might prepare his heart, uh, that Lord, that he might continue to lead uh, the 
he might continue to direct and, and help us uh, to understand what's, what's happening, that he might become a figurehead to this new change, this piece of work that we are having to do. Lord, we may direct our plans, we may think of ways in which we're to do this, but Lord, above all, we are seeking your face, that you might help us, that we might listen and discern your voice. That it's not just about ministers and representative elders from across the denomination, across the island. But this is the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. It is our General Assembly. That we may pray for all the business. That we may pray, Lord, for the direction. That we may pray for your spirit to pour out upon us in these days. That congregation by congregation may be filled with a fresh and filling of your spirit. So help us to immerse it in prayer. Be with us in our conversations and our fellowship. Those times when we can catch up with colleagues we haven't seen from last year and share with one another, encourage one another, uh, maybe go away with topics that we might pray for one another. For all the administration, for the busyness of the few days. Lord, give us strength. But above all, Lord, we pray that we might know your presence. That we might know your spirit in our conversation. So be with us, we pray. Lord, we think of those who are unwell. We think, Lord, that those who have been buried. Lord, draw near to each one, we pray. Continue to help those members of the congregation not with us, that as they may listen later on, they may realise that we have been praying for them. We encourage and help. For we ask it through Jesus' precious name. Amen. We stand again to sing. Uh, really the words that um, follow on from our reading of Matthew 6. Seek ye first the kingdom.
Well, big thank you to everyone who has taken part uh, so far uh, this morning. Thinking about those verses, that idea of where our treasure is. It's now summertime, isn't it? We've seen the summer this last week. I think we've also seen the autumn and winter in this past week because there's been a whole mixture of weather that has come our way. But as we come towards the summer, we're maybe starting to think of the summer holidays and think of where we might be going, what sort of fun we're going to have. Anybody going somewhere nice over the summer? Who wants the event? Where are you going? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Lovely. Bring us back some rock. Okay. Where else are we going? Anywhere nice? Who's going to France? There we go, yes. James, where are you going? Oh, lovely. That'd be nice. All sorts of things. Who's going to try and get to the beach? Even for a day. Isn't it brilliant? Down on the beach, just walking along the sand, kicking your shoes and socks off, paddling. Who brings their kettle with them? So they can pour it into the water at their feet, so that'll be a bit of the water, just it's nice and warm. And so, there's something really wonderful about just walking along the beach, just paddling your feet. All of a sudden, for me, you just feel all the stress levels begin to drop. And as I was younger, one of the things I loved to do was to really just go out and explore rock pools. Who likes the rock pools? Trying to find all the bits and pieces and then bring them. You go there, who, you're looking for little crabs and, and you get all sorts of things. And, and days gone by, we had little nets that you'd put in to try and catch things and you look at them and throw them back in. And it was absolutely brilliant. Who gathers up the seaweed, brings it home and dries it out? Wee bit of dulse? No. Anybody have dulse lately? Isn't it good? Absolutely brilliant. Lots of iron in it, really good for you. Um, although I did hear of somebody who, who went down on the beach and gathered all this and I don't think it was the right type of seaweed and they dried it out and they began to eat it and it was stinking. So maybe don't do that just in the off chance you get the wrong sort of seaweed and it's not good for you. It has all sorts of impacts. But I want to tell you a story about a little boy called, unfortunately, Bella. <laughs> it, it just so happens that's the name of the boy in the story. It's not any particular bit like if you understand what I mean. <coughs> so Billy had gone to the, the beach with his parents. And he had gone and he had been exploring all the way through all those rock pools and stuff. And, and doing what little boys do. They were finding all these rocks. And then when you lift them up, you get all the little creepy crawlies and stuff that come out from underneath it. And he was poking and poking at them and, and doing all sorts of things. And, and he was just having so much fun, really exploring it all the way through. It was absolutely brilliant. And as Billy was lifting this rock and looking under it, he heard a voice shouting, Billy! Behind you! And he stopped and he looked round and there was nobody there. And he thought, I'm imagining things. And he went on another wee bit and he's going through it. And then the voice came, Billy! Behind you! And he thought, I wonder. And he turned around and there was a huge big he thought, I wonder what? I wonder if there's something there. So he went over to the rock and he began to push it a wee bit. He began to push it another bit. And he thought, right, he'd get in underneath it. And he got a bit of wound and he tried to manhandle it up. And he got it up a bit and he, and he got right down on his knees and he shoved it up and stuff. And do you know what was underneath the rock? A what? Another rock, no. And it wasn't a crab. It was a key. I thought, I wonder what that's for. And then the voice came again, Billy, behind you! And I thought, but sure, there's nothing behind me except that. The cliff. Billy, behind you! And he went over to the cliff. He started looking. All of a sudden, he began to see there was a bit of a line in the cliff. It was almost like a doorway and he, he started to pull some of the undergrowth away and get all the way through it and so on. And do you know what he found? A key. And he thought, I have a key. And I have a keyhole. And he put the key 
in. And he tried to turn him, it was really stiff, and he tried to. And he finally got it. And the door bounced open. And he thought, what am I going to do? Well, what would you do if a door bounced open in front of you, in the side of a cliff? Would you go in? Would you? Or would you say, Daddy, that looks really dark. Would you go in first? No. Billy was very inquisitive. Billy was very curious. And so he pulled the door. And it was hinging. It was a cave. And he thought, oh, brilliant. I better go in. So he crept in. And he went up one side. And the further in he went, the darker it got. The smellier it got. He was getting drips of water bouncing onto the top of his head. It was starting to get really, really smell. And he got, kept on creeping forward and creeping forward. He went, oh, 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 my knees, oh. Until he found a chest. A big box chest. And he opened it. And it too was very rusty and very sticky. And so he started pulling this up and pulling it up and pulling it up and he got it on. And do you know what was inside? Coins. Jewelry. Silver. Lots and lots of stuff. And he got so excited and this was absolutely brilliant. And so he started to pick them up and he shoved them down his jumper and into his pockets. He put his socks out and he put them in the socks and he got more and more and he Got a big bundle up, they started running. And the boys went, Billy! You've left the best thing behind. And he went, I can't look. Look how much I'm carrying all this. I'm rich, I'm rich. Billy, you've left the best thing behind. And I thought, hold on. I went into the cave, down the left hand side. What if there's something over? So he went over to the other side. And he went along. And he crept in. And he put his hand on the side. And it was all slimy and horrible and stuff. And then there were things crawling over his feet and all the rest. And he got in and he got further in. And he went, oh, the other day this time. Oh, that's good. Another box. Another big chest. And he opened it. And do you know what was inside that? Gold. More coins. So he started to empty all the stuff out of his socks and out of his jumper and he threw that down. And he got all the gold stuff and he started shoving that in. Got as much in his hands and all the rest. And he ran out and the first went, Billy! You've left the best thing behind. Couldn't have, he says. It's gold. You've left the best thing behind. I went down the left hand side. I went down the right hand side. What about down the middle? And so he crept in again. And he crept in. And he was being really careful. He had his hand out in front of him so he wouldn't bang his knees anymore. And, and so on. But eventually he had to put a foot out in front of him. And that's when he kicked that box. And so he's like to be sore knees and a sore foot and all the rest of it. And he opened it. And do you know what was inside that? Diamonds, rubies, emeralds, sapphires. There was so much stuff he got. Oh, he started to empty everything out again. He grabbed it. He took as much as he could, even more. He was, he was even putting some in his mouth, which was really dangerous. But as much as he could get his hand on, carried out as he was running out, he banged against the door. Door slammed behind him. And the voice said, Billy, you've left the best thing behind. He says, I can't have. Silver is good. Gold is better. Jewelry's the best. I'm rich. I've got everything I need. And the voice says, Billy, you've left the best thing behind. Can't have. And the voice said, Billy, where's the key? 
when he had brought the key, he had taken it out, he had put it in his pocket, and in the midst of throwing everything out and putting everything back in, the key had dropped on the ground. The door was closed, and he wouldn't get back in. Yes, he had stuff, but the door was shut. Finished. Jesus spoke about the best thing. In Matthew's Gospel, he talks about teaching them what it's like to be a disciple. He starts with a be attitude. You think about a be attitude. How is we're meant to live? To consider God's ways first. He goes on to talk about the fact that we're to be salt and light. He goes on to say that actually the law was, didn't go far enough. We have to go beyond that. He says, love your enemies. Be good to those who persecute you. If you don't kill, that's one thing. But actually, to be angry is as bad. Then he starts to teach about prayer. He starts about teaching about giving to others. He starts to teach about fasting. All about growing in our relationship with him. With God our Heavenly Father. And then he comes to this thing. He says about our treasures in heaven. We all know as we think about it today. Who remembers decimalization? Who wants to admit that they remember decimalization? But as I understand it. Decimalization meant that everything overnight became bare. When it was old pennies for new pennies. It cost more of the new pennies was there. And we see that in everything we do. When we're going to buy something, everything is there. All of a sudden our money doesn't stretch as far. It becomes more and tighter and difficult. Then Paul says the love of money is a root to all kinds of evil. And Jesus talks about having treasures in our heart. About this sense of not having earthly treasures. Where moth and rust can come in and take them away. It used to be sort of thing with clothes and moths. What they would do is they'd sort of come and plant their eggs and, and begin to eat holes in our clothes. Coins weren't as pure as they, they are these days and so folk had had coins but there would have been imperfections in them and, and so the silver would have been filled with all sorts of stuff and over time they'd begin to rust and then really just fall apart. He says our eyes are a lamp to the body. What, what he is saying is really that all of a sudden when we start to see things, we can get tempted by them and think this is the best way forward. Who's ever heard the saying, your eyes are bigger than your belly? That sense that all of a sudden we sort of think, you know what, I'll keep hanging a bit of food on and then we can't eat it all because our eyes, we thought we could eat it and then we end up wasting it becomes counterproductive. This idea that we think the more stuff we have, the more we need, the more we'll be satisfied. But actually what happens is that the more we have, the less satisfied we become and we keep pushing and pushing. We get so caught up with our time, our talents, our service, just about satisfying ourselves and not about to get to Jesus and what he wants for our lives. We leave the best thing behind that is Jesus in our hearts. And Jesus continued to speak in, in Matthew's Gospel. He, he talks about we uh, are living for our best life. And to do that, we put him first. Peterson translates that last bit of the chapter. He says, if you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows you don't fuss about what's on the table at late times or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There's far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tying down the job descriptions, careless in the care of God. And you count far more to him than birds. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God's provision. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Jesus was saying our treasure should be in heaven. Our treasure should be within. The reality of knowing our lives are saved 
and knowing our lives are entrusted within his care. And once we have that reality, then everything else begins to fall into place. Everything else comes when we put him first, when we realize he is the key. But the rest of our life fits in with him leading and directing us. We seek first the kingdom. Nothing else can save but the name of Jesus. We store up treasures in heaven. Because where our treasure is, our heart will be also. We put Christ first. He looks after the rest for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you indeed for your love for us. Thank you that you are the key to life, the key of showing us the way to live, showing us how we are to respond to you. That when we have Christ in our hearts, Christ in our lives, that all else fits into place, finds its true priority. But it's Jesus first, leading us, guiding us through life, through our ambitions, through our desires, that he helps us to show the way. So Lord, we pray in you that we may not leave the best thing behind. We may not forget about Jesus, but instead put him first. For we ask our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn that reminds us of the reality that because of what Christ has done for us, that grace that he pours out upon us, that we will offer him our life to follow him. We'll sing this after we finally we, we sing this. Please take your seats and then I'll just remind you of what's going to happen next. What grace is mine. <clears throat>
if you go into the big hall, uh, there'll be the opportunity, as I say, to get a cup of tea, uh, some coffee. As I say, our Mitchell and chefs left a little earlier. Um, so the barbecues are already on, the foods are already beginning to be prepped for us. Um, and then we'll, we'll get that served up as, as quickly as possible. Um, when you get your seats, sit nice, fold your arms, don't talk to the people beside you because they understand that uh, Leslie's going to bring you up in, in particular order. So those that are sitting good might, might be brought up first, you know, we used to do that in school and so on. Um, just remind you of that. And then we're going to have a bit of fun and stuff afterwards. I think there's maybe, um, I think actually there's an icebreaker, isn't it? At the very start, so you're maybe not going to be able to sit. Uh, just quietly uh, and so on, um, but we'll guide you with that as the time uh, comes. So, let me close with the benediction and with a word of grace uh, for what we're doing. For those that need to go on, may God bless you as you continue to celebrate uh, Father's Day in the light and love of our good and true Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you indeed that you have called us to yourself. We thank you for your love and your grace to us. And so we pray that as we share in fellowship together, we thank you for the hands that are providing the food for all the organisation that has gone on behind the scenes. Father, may this be a time of blessing and of sharing with one another. And so we ask indeed your blessing upon us. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and remain with you forevermore. Amen. And there's a little thing for all the men. All the men on your way.